Today, on Rational Alchemy, we take a look at one of the most contentious issues in education today, charter schools. Charter schools have been increasingly in the news since the appointment of Betsy DeVos by President Trump to be his Secretary of Department of Education. We'll talk about the differences between charter schools and public schools and also what they have in common. We'll learn what a focus on one means for the other. And does it need to be one or the other? Here to help us cut through the rhetoric is Cameron Hoxie. So Cameron, welcome back to the studios. It's thank good, you, to, my good to have you here again. Oh, thank you, my friend. Thank you. I'm glad to be back. So we're going to talk about charter schools today and dedicate the whole program to charter schools. But let's first start at the beginning. Why are there charter schools? Well, I, th I think there are really two answers to that. It, on, on one hand, charter schools can fulfill a legitimate, real need in a school district. If if there there is an educational need that's not being met or cannot be met by the, the local school district, a charter school can can perform that function. I think most people think of the, you know, the, the fame TV show mm -hmm. school, you know, as a performing arts school and obviously uh, a standard brick and mortar public school can't fulfill that need. So that's that's one reason for the existence of charter schools. Unfortunately, the other and uh, more insidious uh, reason for the existence of charter schools is profitability. There are a lot of companies making a lot of money, taxpayers' money, on the charter school industry. And, and I think that's probably what most people uh, maybe don't understand as much, and some people get very exercised about it. So that's kind of feast and famine. Right, right. Now, Going back to your idea of the, the fame school, right. okay. Now, if memory serves me well, that series was out well before um, the first charter school. Yeah. Okay, so that would have been a paid-for school. Right. Which is how it should be, in, yeah. in my humble opinion, because I'm used to the, the English method. Right. So, you know, in England, we, we, have, these, uh, we have these schools. We have uh, the public school system. We have the private school system. And then we have the special school systems like the Fames, Arts, etc. But if you wish your kid to go to one of those schools, then you start to pay good, serious money for them. Well, it, it, so so here's a a union guy sitting mm -hmm. here going to disagree with you. Okay, my humble opinion. Um, I think there are very legitimate instances where a free and appropriate public education, you know, maximizing. Uh, what kids can be exposed to and, and really helping them reach their, their limits can be accomplished within the, the, the context of taxpayer-funded free public education. Okay. Now, I would agree with you if we're talking about uh, religious schools or um, maybe schools where the, the curriculum is substantially different from what is taught in a public school system. And I would agree that those should be, in my opinion, privately funded schools. If you want your kid to go to Catholic school, great. But I, I think most, well, I was going to say most Americans don't think we should pay for that with taxpayers' money. That may be an overstatement. But, but I think that's the way, that was kind of the traditional way we've, we've had education set up mm -hmm. in the U.S. You know, we have this idea of, of the commons, that there are certain things that, government funded help everyone and and the idea that I always have about that is you're driving down the road and it's a it's the commons it's a publicly funded road and I'm paying taxes for it maybe the guy in front of me has a job that you know he doesn't make that much money he, he's gonna get all of his tax money back but he still gets to use the road the guy behind me makes a whole lot more money than I do he pays a lot more taxes he gets to use the road too but Maybe the guy in front works for him. I mean, it, it's yes. it's this idea of, 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 you know, everybody benefits. And I think that's that was the idea that, you know, 100 years ago, 
we we realized that education in, as a commons is is a benefit for all of us and so you you can have charter schools that fulfill a specific need i think where it gets dodgy is where you know you have millions of dollars coming out of the this this industry that's taxpayers money and the re the results may not be what we think they are right right Talking of results, I mean, um, wh where do you think charter schools fit in when it when it comes to the academics well, I, aspect? I, I don't have to think about it. I know because there there have been studies. There there, are, an aggregate study looked at 80 different studies. They call it a meta study. 80 different studies looking at the effectiveness of charter schools. And when you combine the data from <coughs> all of those those studies, and when you normalize it for geography. Um, there, roughly, there is no statistical difference between how charter schools perform and public schools perform. Some perform slightly better than each other, some perform slightly worse, but there's no real statistical difference in the aggregate. It, you can, now, now, let me say, you can always find an amazing charter school that performs better than its regional peer public schools. Conversely, you can find public schools that perform but it it's a mixed bag but on average when you when you level when, everything out yep it's we're not getting a great bang for our buck that's interesting so why do you think then that there is this big push for charter schools especially by uh, DeVos well okay so going off the reservation completely opinion here okay I think that and, and so I trained as a historian initially, so I tend to look at things from a historical perspective. 30 years ago or so, there was this uh, idea that, well, it still exists today, but in some factions, government can't do anything. And if you had big business performing this function of the commons, they could do it better and cheaper for the taxpayers. Uh, we tried it with, with prisons. We privatized prisons, and it was, it was a disaster. It was a complete failure. The next thing we've looked at for privatizing to, to let companies run it and supposedly do it better is education. Education's a huge business. There's a lot of taxpayer money going into education. And so, the, the, in my opinion, the, the major driver for the charter school, a significant portion of the charter school movement is profitability. Now you also see it in educational testing and, and mm -hmm. other areas, but the charter school is, is the big one. That's where the bucket loads of money are. What's interesting is enable, to enable the public to buy into this idea, the first thing you have to do is spin the narrative that public schools are bad. Think about, okay, so here's an analogy. I love analogies. So. You live in a, a neighborhood in Longmont, and you go to the, the city council and you say, you know, our neighborhood, we don't think the police department's meeting the needs of that neighborhood. So we would like you to authorize a charter police department for our neighborhood. Pull some money out of the police department's budget, we'll have our own charter police department. Oh, there, I forgot to mention, there's some small details. Our police officers won't have to be credentialed. We will be able to pick and choose whose houses we actually cover with the, you know, the Johnsons that don't weed their beds. They're not going to be covered in our, our charter police department. And, uh, oh yeah, if they're really difficult things to investigate, murder, robbery, that kind of thing, the local police department has to come in and do that because we, we're just not going to do that. No, I don't think anyone would buy into that as an idea. Well, actually, it sounds like a winner to me, but I'm going to be the one that starts it. Well, uh, well, well, you really you don't have the expertise to run a police department, so well, we. Well, all what, what difference does that make? I don't need any expertise. You know, I'll, I'll hire a private company and. There you go. So you've missed the boat there. You want to be the one who owns the private neighborhood oh. police charter department that run. Yeah. Exactly. And no, I, I really messed up on that one, you, didn't I? You, well, there's still time. You can get in on it. I, I, bet I, I bet I can. Yeah. Hey, we could do the same thing for the fire department. Military. What Blackwater. We've done it already. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, and, and so when you think about what you're really talking about, privatizing with, with taxpayers' money, privatizing schools, 
the threshold, I think, mm -hmm. to get people to go along with that is pretty high. You have to really sell a narrative that what your kid is getting in school is crap. Yes. And the data just really doesn't support that. So the overall data. The overall data, yeah. yeah. And data, data, not data, data. data. Um, one, one, one thing, um, you mentioned that this, this police force that we're going to start. Right. We don't want to look after the Johnsons because they're, they, don't, they just don't do any weeding. Right. But I don't believe that's strictly true, is it, for charter schools? Um, I read somewhere that charter schools had to accept students. The devil's in the details. Ah. Okay, so here, here's what we would do in our, our, our charter police department, and, and this is actually what you see in, in charter schools. Yes, they may have to accept students. There's something called the October count, and in different localities it can vary at different times. The way schools are funded, they're, they're funded on a per-pupil basis. So your school district gets a certain amount of money, but each school is funded for how many students are actually sitting in that school. Because it can vary over the summer, people can move and whatnot. Yes. So in, Oct in our <clears throat> school district, St. Brain, every October, beginning of October, they come in and account. They literally uh, uh, administrator or secretary will come in, they'll go down the roll, kids will stand up, and, and they'll count, they'll turn these numbers in, that's where the funding comes from. Now once the October funding is set, that's it. More kids move in to the neighborhood under construction next to your school and, and come in in December, January, whatever, doesn't matter, your funding is set by the October count. Conversely, if a charter school has their October count, they get their funding, and then the students leave or are thrown out of the school or find it's not a good fit and come back to public schools, that money stays with the charter school. I'm a special ed teacher, and the, the most expensive students to educate appropriately yes. are special ed students. I will routinely get four or five students a year that come in after the October count and so my, my school and my district will willingly mm -hmm. accept the burden, the financial burden, of educating those students for the rest of that year. Now, if they come to our school the next year, then we're, we're good, we're funded. But that money, that, the money that we need to, to educate that student, remains with the charter school. Okay, I'd like to go back to this October time yes. frame with, you, with your example. So, I have two students. I have one student in a public school, one student in a charter school. Mm -hmm. Let us say the charter school closes down in November for whatever reason, and I believe the numbers are fairly high. The, the numbers are catastrophic. Okay, let, let, let's, get, let's talk about that in a second. Okay. So, student, the, the, the school closes, the student goes back to public school, Mm -hmm. What happens to that money? I mean, is it paid in a lump sum up front? Is it paid monthly? How's this done? It's, as far as I know, the way, in the public school, that money is paid in a lump sum. Okay. So that, that money is in the coffers of either school. Okay. <laughs> and it stays in the So basically what you're telling me is is I need to open a charter school for about two days in October. Uh, well, you'd probably run into a little problem there. You'd probably have to start in October, in uh, August. Oh, so you, blimey. You do a oh. month and a half. But here's what we can do. We can set up, um, we can be selective. We can set up, uh, let's see, some of the things that have been done. Um, you want to register your kid for our charter school. The registration is in the middle of the day, on a Tuesday, 30 miles from here. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand which parents are going to be able to afford to leave work or not go to work. Right. Okay, that's one thing. Another thing we could do is we could set up a uh, a contract between the school and the parents, mm -hmm. and we could require a certain number of uh, volunteer hours by the parents per month during school time. Ah, so we're gonna, and we'll start calculating when those hours start, like 
October 30th. Interesting. Discipline can be another uh, another thing that can affect the population of a charter school. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, there are some things here worth looking into. I, I've always said, being an actor, I've always said, and I, I've, I've strongly believed this ever since I heard it, the only way to make real money in America is to start your own religion, <laughs> which of course happened to create Scientology. Um, but now it seems to be charter schools, so there is a possibility here that if you register as a, a company to guide me who will start the charter school, that's only going to be open for three or four weeks, uh, we could make a bundle of money out we of this. Could, we could make a wad of money, and there are examples of this. There, there are examples nationwide, and there are examples here in Colorado. Um, there was a, the, the largest Colorado online school, um, their numbers are amazing. Yeah, uh, that's totally sarcastic. 24% mm -hmm. um, of their students uh, log into their educational software every day. So a quarter of their students actually do school every day. Uh, you can get one year's credit in a week. Wow. Highly motivated students. And less than 4% of their students are proficient in math. They make millions of dollars. They were, they were actually, uh, they're kind of a shell game with companies, but they were, the first company was closed mm -hmm. by regulators, and then they spun off into another company. Millions and millions of dollars. Uh, there's another, uh, uh, it, it is, I want to get the name right, Denver School of Science and Technology. They paid between 50 and, between 20 and 50 million dollars to the education management company, the EMOs, they call them organization. So this for-profit management company to manage the school was paid between 20 and $50 million. Oddly enough, that company was owned by members of the board of directors of the school. Now th that's taxpayers' money, mind you. It's not, you know, a charity. It's not lotto money. It's taxpayers' money. 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 So they weren't paying Peter to feed Paul, they were paying Peter to feed Peter, basically. That's just too easy. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and nationwide there are examples of this, you know, throughout the nation. And that, that kind of brings us to another issue. There, there, there is, well, let me back up. So who gets to create a charter school? It's, they call it the authorizing agency. Different mm -hmm. states can call it different. Yes. Roughly, it's the authorizing agency. Um, in my opinion, in NEA's opinion, National Education mm -hmm. Association, the, the, the best practices are that the local school district is the organization that says, yes, we will, organize, we will approve this charter school. There's a need. We can fund it appropriately. Um, we can provide oversight. Mm -hmm. In some states, there are up to 40 different organizations that can approve charter schools. Community that, that doesn't mean you need 40 different signatures. It's no. just any one of those 40 could have any given one of the stamp those of approval. 40 are legally authorized to allow the creation of a publicly funded charter school. So the transparency, the, the ability to, um, to, to, to look at what charter schools are doing varies widely from state to state. I mean, just, just take the issue of, of teacher competency or, or teacher licensing, right? 50 states, 50 different charter school rules on who can be a teacher in a charter school. Right. You run the gamut from states whose state statutes say that a charter school teacher must have the same qualifications mm -hmm. and same licensing as a traditional public school teacher, all the way to Alabama, where you can have a I, I, I laugh because it seems inconceivable, but it, it's the truth. You can have a teacher in an Alabama charter school, publicly funded charter school, who does not have a college degree. Something seems wrong there. 
again, it's the untied states of America. Mm -hmm. Different yeah. states have different rules and different regulations, but to me, to, to have a totally unqualified person teaching, unallowable by law, seems terribly wrong. Uh, I something wrong there somewhere. I agree with you, the NEA agrees with you, and, and, I, and here's the thing, here's what's more, I think most people would agree with you, most taxpayers, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't imagine the average taxpayer, if you knock on their door and say, excuse me, are you, you okay with your money going to, right. <laughs> you, you know, for your kid, a teacher who doesn't have a college degree, or no training in teaching at all, no pedagogy, no, no, this is how you fill out a grade report. <laughs> I think they'd probably be a little, a, a, a little dismayed at that. I think you're probably right. 